So welcome back to another session of advanced algorithms. Last time we started to look at the randomized complexity classes. We defined our classification of uh, randomized algorithms, which were Las Vegas methods on the one side and Monte Carlo methods on the other side. And for Monte Carlo, we had two variants, namely the bounded error and the unbounded error case. And for these three types of algorithms, we defined corresponding classes of problems uh, that are exactly the decision problems, so languages in the formal sense, that have an algorithm from this category with a worst case running time that's polynomial in the input size, as usual for classes that end with a P. So in all cases, the P stands for poly time. And then CPP was zero error probabilistic poly time. That was uh, for Las Vegas methods. And recall that these methods um, never return a wrong result. So for languages, we only had these three different outcomes. Uh, a certain word can either be in the language or not in the language. Uh, but we also allow this question mark, which is used in the Las Vegas method to indicate a run that just failed to be conclusive. Uh, so this was an option that we used for Las Vegas methods to guarantee that they terminate. Now we had these uh, three different classes and we were asking the question, how do they relate to the ordinary complexity classes P, NP, and maybe also uh, in the classes FPT that we've seen uh, for parameterized complexity. And we've already seen one uh, argument why the distinction for Monte Carlo methods between unbounded error and bounded error is very important because for bounded errors we could use this majority voting scheme only a logarithmic time and we had success probability that goes to one with super polynomial rate that was this high probability result that we had whereas for um, for the unbounded error class that was not true so that's already an indication that the two are very different and we already stated that result last time it's not only that it's a bit more complicated with unbounded error uh, algorithms. But actually, the class PP is a superset of NP and co-NP. So it can completely simulate any non-deterministic uh, Turing machine, uh, which also, in if we, if we once we prove that, which what I'll do in a second, then we can conclude that the class PP is actually not a sensible candidate for realistic efficient algorithms, realistic, efficient, randomized algorithms, because it's uh, too mighty, it encompasses too many algorithms like the classes NP and co-NP that we actually do not consider efficient. Now how can we prove that uh, P, PP contains NP? The first observation towards this is that since these classes are defined to be the languages that have a poly time PP algorithm, so an unbounded error Monte Carlo method, uh, the important point is the poly time here. So it's fair to allow some overhead as long as it's uh, poly time. So we can simply use any of our good old poly time reductions to transform one problem to another one. We can use these as a pre-processing before we actually start with the randomized algorithm that we are going to design. And what's the good thing about poly time reductions? Well, we know that SAT is NP complete. We 
which means if we solve SAT with an unbounded error of Monte Carlo method, so we, if we show that SAT is in this class, we have directly shown that all of NP is in this class because we can always transform any problem x in NP or any language, say. There's a polytime reduction. So there's some function so that this is in SAD exactly when x is in L. And then we can decide whether this is true with our PP algorithm. That's the same kind of idea we used for uh, reductions all the time. And we're actually going to follow this route, so we will in a second show how to solve SAT with an unbounded error Monte Carlo method. But this only gives us uh, one part of the claim. The claim was actually s talking about P, NP and CoNP. As we will see, the methods used in the proof apply equally well to show that the class of all tautologies, so the class of all formulas, so that all, all assignments satisfy the formula, is also in PP. And since this language is co and P complete, this implies that all of co and P is a subset of PP. And we will not uh, in detail do the second part Uh, but as if you go through the steps of the algorithm that we'll construct now, you see that it's a very simple algorithm that applies to this problem as well. Okay, so how to show that SAT is in PP? We don't even require any specific normal form for SAT. We just assume we're given a formula phi. of length n and say phi contains k variables then our unbounded error Monte Carlo method in poly time so it will be an algorithm of this kind uh, it proceeds as follows first We generate a random assignment. For the k variables. So that's an alpha that assigns the value 0 or 1 to each of the k variables. Let's just write this as a vector. So and it, it generates this assignment uniformly at random. So we can easily do that with k random bits. That's obvious. The second step of the algorithm is very simple. If alpha is already a satisfying assignment, then we accept the input, because for sure, then the formula is satisfiable. So this needs time linear in n if the formula is given in a reasonable, reasonable way, in any case poly time. And it doesn't even use randomness. Now the third step is the interesting part. If this does not work, if alpha was not a satisfying assignment, so then we accept the input if and only if a random coin flip with a certain probability returns one. And this probability is given by one half minus a very small quantity we can write that on one fraction which helps to see that 
we can easily simulate a random coin flip with that probability by drawing k plus 1 random bits. And if these k random bits correspond to the binary representation of a number that is at most 2 to the k minus 1, then we return 1, otherwise we return 0 for this coin flip. So that's one of the of the coin flips that we can precisely simulate. And let's just note for reference that p is a tiny bit less than 1 half. So my claim is that this algorithm A actually solves the set problem. Let's first look at the time complexity. We already discussed that here. And it's essentially linear in, in n and k because we need a certain number of random bits here and there and then we have to evaluate one formula. That's certainly poly time and it's even an efficient thing. Now we also have to show that this is actually uh, accepting in the sense of an unbounded error Monte Carlo method exactly the words that correspond to a satisfiable formula. To do so, we make a case distinction. The first case is that phi is actually a satisfiable formula. That means that the probability for a random assignment to satisfy that formula has to be some non-zero quantity, right? There is a satisfying assignment. And in the worst case, there's exactly one such. And then this, the total number of assignments for k variables is just two, or 2 to the k. 1 over 2 to the k is at least the probability to find a satisfying assignment. Now let's compute the probability that the algorithm rejects the formula, claims that it is not satisfiable despite the fact that it actually is. And we'll have to show, so we, we're claiming that this is less than, well that looks a bit silly, so we claim that this is less than one half because this is what unbounded error Monte Carlo said. The correct answer must be given with probability more than one half, strictly greater than one half. So the probability to answer the wrong way must be bounded by something less than one half. Now the algorithm answers with zero in exactly the case that the step two does not accept and step three has a coin flip of zero. So that means uh, we have the probability that step 2 does not accept the formula and we have the step that this coin flip is, is 0 now I already wrote these as the product of the probabilities and the reason is that we assume that all these random bits that we draw here are independent, right? All random bits independent, mutually independent even. That's the default assumption that we were always uh, making when we were uh, talking about randomized algorithms. So that was part of the, of the computational model actually. We assumed we're considering Turing machines with an additional input tape that just contains an unboundedly long infinite sequence of mutually independent random bits. And that means that the probability for some event that depends on step one and the same for step three, they are independent. And that's why the probability is factor. Now here, this probability, the first one we have bounded uh, just before, if we use the counter probability, we get the other in inequality. 
And this probability is just uh, 1 minus p by definition. And if you look at p, so this is 1 minus p, and 1 minus p can be simplified to 1 half plus 1 over 2 to the k plus 1. Well, and if you simplify that, uh, essentially you find that this is um, a good deal less than one, more, it's more or less than one, then this is greater than one half. That's why the whole result is a bit smaller than one half. And that's exactly what we had to show, right? So in this case, uh, the unbounded error Monte Carlo criterion for acceptance is satisfied. And the second case now is that uh, phi is not a satisfiable formula. Well, that means the probability to draw a satisfying assignment must be zero, because there is none. Um, now we again compute the probability that the algorithm rejects this formula. But this time we want to show that this is actually greater than one half, because it's the correct answer now, right? If is not satisfiable we want the algorithm to reject now the counter probability of this is just one and the second step to reject because of the coin flip is is the same as before so it's one minus p and well this is the same as before it's the one half plus two to the k plus one which certainly is greater than one half. So in total, we've seen that A is an unbounded error Monte Carlo algorithm for SAT and always runs in poly time. So we've shown that SAT is in PP and by the uh, arguments that I sketched before this also implies that the whole of NP is in PP and if we want to go back to the second part the, that co in P is also contained in PP you can just take the same algorithm and apply it to the tautology problem and really things don't change so the same idea works works there as well. Okay, so unbounded error Monte Carlo methods are definitely too weak a model or, well, too strong an algorithm or too weak a restriction to give anything useful because there's just an easy way to simulate all NP problems. Uh, let me note also that this algorithm is, for one, it's very simple. It's very efficient. It's essentially linear time for a problem like SAT. We don't expect to solve SAT in linear time, really. And the analysis of the success probability is actually tight if you, if you construct formulas that are exactly this, this probabilities to be satisfiable if, if it is, or that just have one satisfying assignment, uh, then the analysis is essentially tight. So this is, it's uh, not something in the proof, it's something in the, in the definition of unbounded error. So we should, should certainly go for bounded errors. Uh, in some cases, we can stick to the restriction that the correct answer must be given only with probability one half. Um, because in, some, in many instances, it's natural that an algorithm has a one-sided error. And that's what I briefly want to discuss. If you look at our algorithm here, uh, it is actually not of this kind. It can, 
it can reject the formula that's actually satisfiable and it can accept a formula that's actually not satisfiable because this random coin flip can go either way. But if you consider a very simple algorithm for the SAT problem that just guesses an assignment and outputs if that, satisfy, uh, if that assignment satisfied the formula, uh, then you will sometimes not recognize a satisfiable formula because you just picked a bad assignment but you will never return false positives. You will never mistakenly accept an unsatisfiable formula because there's no uh, assignment you could guess that makes this formula satisfied. So this algorithm, as I just sketched it, doesn't give you a sensible error bound because as we just discussed for some formulas, there are only very few satisfying assignments. So the probability to guess one of these good ones is just unboundedly small. But for other problems or more clever algorithms, you can, can also devise an algorithm that never errs in, in one uh, direction, but only in the other. That motivates this, this second definition of Monte Carlo, the third definition of Monte Carlo methods. A one-sided error Monte Carlo algorithm for a language. So this only makes sense for decision problems where you have only two possible outcomes. A one-sided error Monte Carlo method for language L uh, is an algorithm that accepts words in the language with probability at least one half and always rejects words that are not in the language. An equivalent way to say that is If the algorithm returns one, then this must always be correct. Whereas the answer, this is not in the language, that might be wrong. It's a bit confusing because this is actually with probability one, so it looks it like it's the other way around, but uh, that's the way it is. So I think this is easier to remember. Now we have a new kind of algorithm, so we can define two more classes of problems. And I promise this will be the last ones that we consider. The classes RP and CoRP are the, the set of languages, so that we have a one-sided error Monte Carlo method for the language itself or for its complements. So this is like in the NP and CoRP, uh, CoNP uh, case where you have this dichotomy of uh, certificates that certify membership or that certify non-membership. That's the same kind of reasoning that you have here. And it's also in the same direction. So the RP without CO is exactly the languages for which you, whenever you accept, you can, you can prove that this must be correct in the sense that there's a, a kind of certificate. If you like, the, the definition of one-sided error Monte Carlo methods uh, as a randomized algorithm can also be seen in like VP in the sense of certificates. The random bit strings now play the role of, this, of the certificates. And one-sided error Monte Carlo just requires that there are certificates so that the algorithm for sure accepts. Um, and there's no cert there. Well, it, in case of doubt, it must say it's not in the language. And the probability that we're talking about here essentially says among all the possible certificates, all random bit strings of the size of random A, at least half of them must be of the good kind. If the word is in the language, they must lead to acceptance. So it's kind of clear that uh, these classes are subsets of, of NP. Um, which we will um, deal with in the exercises. Interestingly, for so let's let's not talk about the theorem, but talk about this first. For the non-deterministic classes, 
it's unclear whether NP and CoNP together are strictly larger than P or not. So in terms of VP or CoVP, the verification point of view, this is the class of problems where we have a yes certificate. So there's a, a small, a short proof that a short certificate that allows you to efficiently prove that something is in the language. And this is the languages where you can give a no certificate, a short proof that something is not in the language. So the prototypical example was SAT, just give a satisfying assignment. Here was TAU, that means uh, give a non-satisfying assignment for showing non-membership. And it's unclear whether the problems that have both certificates are actually efficiently solvable. It might look like it is, but actually checking the certificate does not, in, 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 in poly time, does not necessarily mean you can find it efficiently. We know that from NP, and it's not in general clear whether you can find an algorithm that always terminates with either of a yes or a no certificate. Uh, we will come back to that discussion a bit later when we talk about primality checks. Uh, so primality, the problem, is the language is called primes, which is just the set of all binary encodings of uh, prime numbers. And the question is, can you efficiently recognize them? For a long time, this was uh, thought to be a candidate to settle this question because it's easy to see that prime is in co and p. Just give some divisor of a number that certifies that it's not a prime. Primes is also in np, which is uh, quite a sophisticated result, but there's some complicated certificate that um, proves that a certain number is prime. It involves a lot of algebra and polynomials over some abstract rings and so on, so it's beyond the scope of the course. But it's for quite some time been known that this, this exists. There is a certificate you can e efficiently check and that, uh, is, that exists exactly if the number is prime. Uh, but for a long time it was open whether primes is actually in P. So by now we know it is, but that's relatively recent. A result and a, a pretty complicated algorithm. It was a, a major breakthrough in complexity theory. Even though the algorithm uh, that they proposed here is not really used in practice because it's relatively complex and we will see that in practice there's sufficiently good randomized methods that are much faster to uh, much faster than this deterministic polytime method. So to sum up the point is still open that we find a, found a problem that is in P and also in those two classes is not so is not anything uh, that settles that question. It would have been interesting to see that, to, sh to show that primes is not in P, but it is. So, but this question is still open and it's a, it's a major open problem in complexity theory. Interestingly, for randomized, for the randomized classes, the corresponding question is, is actually very easy and we can settle that with a simple proof. And that also might be a first hint that randomization is a, a good deal weaker a concept than non-determinism because for non-determinism this is this is still unclear whether you can find an algorithm that always gives you one certificate or the other. Now let's uh, prove this theorem 421. So the statement is that a problem for which we have a one-sided Aramonte-Carlo method 
And we also have one for the complement language. Then we can also construct a Las Vegas algorithm for that problem. And the other way around. Uh, but actually, the one direction is, is trivial. So this inclusion is trivial. Since uh, if, if A is a Las Vegas algorithm, OK, poly time Las Vegas algorithm for language L, then we can just construct two algorithms. So B always returns, um, let's write it in like this. A new algorithm that returns A of X if A of X is a, a real answer. So Las Vegas method must always be correct, but it might also say, I don't know. And in that case, we can answer zero. Then B is a one-sided error Monte Carlo method for L. And we can also define a symmetric version with the same case distinction. But then we return one whenever this result was inconclusive. Oh, well, we should return one minus a of x in that case. Then this is a one-sided error Monte Carlo method for L bar, which together shows that L is in, in both of the classes, right? So it's an RP and co-RP. The other direction is slightly more interesting because now we are we're given an L that's in the complement. So that means we have a Las Vegas algorithm poly time. A poly time Las Vegas algorithm. Oh, sorry. Poly time one sided error Monte Carlo algorithm for a language L. And we have the same thing for the complement language of L. And we now should construct a Las Vegas algorithm for that same language. And we do by, we can construct one by running b of x and b bar of x. And depending on the outcome, uh, we accept or reject the input x. So if sorry, if B says one, that means B says I'm sure this word is in the language. So this must be correct. Then we can accept. And symmetrically if B bar says, I'm very sure that this is not in the language, then we can believe this one and reject the input. Whereas if both agree that it might or might not be uh, in the language, so B says, I think it's not in the language, and B bar says, I think it's not in the complement, then we actually don't know, so we return question mark. But this only happens with probability at most one half. Because in either case, either, either, either if x is in the language, then the probability for the first event must be at most one half by definition of one-sided error Monte Carlo. Whereas if x is not in the language, then the probability that the second equality holds has a probability at, at most one half. So in, in any case, probability is at most one half. 
Well, and there's the fourth case. If we just look at the outcomes, that this is actually impossible. So if both algorithms say, I'm sure that this is in the language, I'm sure this is not in the language, uh, there, there must be something wrong. So for correct algorithms, B and B bar, this can't happen. So the resulting algorithm certainly is a polytime method because it essentially runs these two algorithms and then does a case distinction. And it's a Las Vegas method for L because it only accepts or rejects when, when it's sure that the answer is correct and otherwise it returns question mark but only with the probability one half at most. So that means that our language then also is in ZPP, which was where we're claiming. Okay, so that was the first hint, as I said, that randomization might be not as as mighty a concept as random as non-determinism is. And we will now talk about um, progress in the theory in complexity theory about randomization I'll just wrap up and present the results we will not go into detail but I think it's it's very important to discuss this at this point and the issue is called de-randomization uh, we can start with the trivial observation that if an algorithm uses only a logarithmic so it, it's essentially O of log n, that's sufficient, right? Uh, if an algorithm uses only a logarithmic number of random bits, then the number of different runs uh, that this algorithm has is, is polynomial. And we could just de-randomize that algorithm by running all of these runs sequentially. So we can simulate with a deterministic algorithm this randomized algorithm, and we only have a polynomial overhead. So that means in terms of the complexity theoretic distinction, polynomial, super polynomial, randomization doesn't help as long as you only allow logarithmic a logarithmic number of random bits. But that's trivial. The interesting point is even if you use more random bits, we often have something called limited limited independence uh, which comes from the fact that some algorithms use use random choices in different groups among different groups of parts in the algorithm and they don't need that the groups are independent the choices inside the groups are independent only all the bits that are used for a single group must be independent and if we have this kind of limited independence we can reduce a bit the number of, of real random bits. Right? Um, for example, well, let's, let's not go into too much of a detail here. <laughs> the point is that sometimes you can, even though an algorithm often calls uh, random bit, the random bit function. Uh, you can actually uh, generate a sequence of bits that's not completely random and the algorithm uh, wouldn't care or its correctness wouldn't be affected. Now you take this idea one step further, namely to the idea of pseudo-random generators. The idea of well, you probably know pseudo-random number generators, which we usually use in a, in a sloppy sense to just denote any kind of program that produces numbers that look kind of random, but they're actually not random but computed by a deterministic function. That's why we call it pseudo-random. In this case, pseudo-random is, is more formally defined so that any efficient algorithm k 
cannot distinguish the output of this generator from a really from a real random sequence. It's a bit unclear maybe at this level what exactly that means, but you can make that precise. And the the great thing about this is that if you have such a thing you can use a limited amount of real randomness, hopefully only logarithmic in the end, and then generate a much longer sequence of random bits and give that as input to your randomized algorithm. There were by that way, you reduce the actual amount of randomness that is used, which means you can de-randomize the algorithm efficiently. Now, we actually don't know if a suitable pseudo-random generator exists that allows to de-randomize uh, the class uh, BPP, for example, so to de-randomize a bounded error Monte Carlo method. Uh, but people have shown a conditional result, namely assuming that there are Boolean functions for which the smallest Boolean circuit that computes that function is complex in a certain sense. So the, the assumption is there are functions that are complex to compute in the sense of finding a good circuit, Boolean circuit to compute that function. And the idea is just there are so many Boolean functions out there that there probably must be one that's uh, complex. But this is an assumption that has not been proven. It's unclear whether this is true. It's widely believed, uh, but it's not proven and it's not, it's not sure, right? But assuming this circuit complexity lower bound, you can generate, you can produce such a random, a pseudo random generator that completely allows to de-randomize the class BPP. So any, un any bounded error Monte Carlo method can be random de-randomized in polynomial time with such a pseudo-random number generator, pseudo-random generator, sorry. And hence the current belief is that actually BPP and P are the same class of problems. And this is very surprising if you think about uh, the examples you might know where randomization makes your life a lot easier. But in the complexity theoretic sense, it seems that it's not really helping you a lot. Well, as you'll show in the exercises, the other classes that we defined except for PP, which is of course out of the, out of the question here. Actually, all the other classes we defined um, lie below BPP. So according to that belief, all these classes collapse to P. So randomization does not help at all in theory to solve problems in poly time, at least under these widely believed assumptions on circuit complexity. And that's quite surprising, but it also means that we don't have a good tool to show that certain problems are specifically unsolvable by randomization. Uh, we can use the same kind of tools if we show that a problem is, is NP-hard. So for you, if you want to deal with a real problem, if a problem is NP-hard, probably the problem is also not solvable by a poly time bounded error Monte Carlo method in the same way as it is probably not solvable by a poly time deterministic algorithm. So it might be bad news that we don't have any nice lower bound results on this scale. For you it might be a good might be good news because you don't have to learn new kinds of reductions. For the rest of our course, uh, this means that we will focus on practical benefits of randomization. Because apart from complexity theory, people are actually uh, sure that randomization helps you a lot to speed up or simplify algorithms in practice. And therefore, 
uh, we'll, can, we'll just look at a, at a list of nice and uh, um, somehow elegant examples where randomization helps us in practical applications. But you should keep in mind the theoretical result that we just had. So that also means that in, in a lot of these problems we will dealing not always be dealing with NP-hard problems, but also with simpler problems for which there are also good deterministic algorithms. But the randomization can make it uh, a bit simpler or even a bit more efficient. To structure the group of examples, um, we will roughly um, talk about these uh, five different um, groups, which is partly they are um, algorithmic design patterns and partly they are the goals that we like to achieve with randomization. So I'll let me just call these categories. One group is something we've already seen. We can use randomization to um, just eliminate worst case inputs in the sense that some, some really evil in user could just figure out a bad input for our algorithm and give it to us repeatedly. So this is actually known under the name algorithmic complexity attacks. And it's something that has really been seen in practice that people attack web servers by supplying them input that makes them, uh, that makes internal hash tables uh, produce a lot of collisions and then you have a denial of, ser of service attack. We've seen the example in quicksort where we randomize the pivot choices to avoid inputs that make quicksort go quadratic. And we will see a few more examples from the data structures um, area where uh, essentially the order of insertion is something you don't have under your control. And you can use very nice and elegant tricks uh, to, to overcome this. Another totally different area is for some problems now again in the decision problem world and for NP problems, if you have a lot of witnesses, so if you know many certificate, there aren't many certificates for uh, that certify that is that an in input is part of the language, then you can just um, guess a random one and check whether it is one, and you get a good randomized algorithm. So this will typically lead to one-sided error Monte Carlo methods. And we will chat, we will uh, talk about primality tests in that respect. So just the idea is just to uh, guess a random certificate or well, a random candidate for a certificate and then check whether it check whether it really is a certificate <coughs> another strategy that you often see is uh, fingerprinting um, which is used in data structures if you have a large universe you can reduce that using a function so this is the essence of hashing you use a function to reduce a large universe to a smaller one, which gives you the problem of collisions. But if you can deal with these, uh, then you often get a very efficient first check. But whenever the fingerprint doesn't match, you know that the, the elements must be different. And while well, we look at uh, universal hashing, something you probably have seen already in an introductory algorithms course where you draw the, ran the hash function at random, which would actually help against these algorithmic complexity attacks if it was used in practice. 
The point is that in, in practical programming libraries, um, developers are a bit reluctant to use randomization for, I think, basically the reason that they mistrust these methods, which is a bit, uh, which is a pity in a sense, because often that would, would help a lot and simplify code a lot. But the same is true actually for quicksort. So I don't know of a programming library that uses a randomized quicksort in the strict sense. They all use a deterministic version and use deterministic uh, means to avoid to avoid the, the quadratic worst case, uh, which is fine. But it it could have been a bit simpler. Uh, but it's it's hard to change minds. So it's it's important that at least you now understand the randomization and well can can maybe change that in the future. Another design principle for randomized algorithms um, is, is random sampling, which is, for example, if you know that some kind of good structure exists, then you can draw random, can generate random structures. And that succeeds with some positive probability. So an example of this kind is perfect hashing, which is a hash function without collisions. If you know the data you're storing up front, you can very easily generate such a thing from universal hashing, which is um, a bit surprising at first, and is, uh, I think, yeah, only doable with random sampling in a, s in a sensible way. Uh, we'll actually see more examples here. We will also see an efficient randomized uh, three-set algorithm invented by Schoening. And probably we'll also look at, uh, at Kaga's MinCat algorithm, which also employ random sampling but in a slightly different sense than perfect hashing does. And the last kind of um, design principle is randomized rounding, which occurs if you relax an optimization problem that typically would give you an integer linear program to a, just a normal linear program that you can solve in poly time. And then afterwards, because the the solution, the optimal solution that you that you compute from the LP will have uh, fractional values. You have to c somehow get back to integers and you use randomized rounding for that. That's something that often helps to give you at least an approximation, even though it doesn't give you an exact solution. Uh, you get a guarantee on the, on the quality of the result. And that perfectly fits into the next chapter when we talk about approximation algorithms. So you'll see an example of that, of that later. Now for, for the randomization chapter, we'll start with the first part today. So let me add that here. We apply randomness to cope with worst case input. Means we essentially remove uh, worst case inputs entirely because we make them, we make our choices in the algorithm randomized. Now, before we start with that, so we've already seen, we've already talked about randomized quicksort where this strategy uh, was effective. Let's now talk about data structures. And let's, as a first step, ignore that there's adversaries. And let's first look at the simplest kind of efficient uh, dictionary data structures. And that's just plain binary search trees. So you know binary search trees from an elementary algorithms course. And you've probably seen the 
the methods how to insert and delete and search in these. And then you usually say, uh, well, there's an input that makes a binary search tree to degenerate to a linear list. Could be like this if you insert the sequence in increasing order. It's not much better to have something like this, which you can give with a different insertion order. So the worst case of binary search trees is, is to have a uh, linear height, which is certainly nothing uh, close to efficient. But the point of this first part is to convince you that these are actually extraordinarily unlikely corner cases that don't occur often. And in, in a sense, they only occur if, if the input is chosen by an adversary who wants to make you go into such a case. If you choose inputs with a random distribution, then you will almost never see such degenerate trees. So what we will talk about is, is called, I'll just call them random BSTs, but some people also call them naturally grown BSTs just because it nicely uh, picks up the tree uh, analogy. And what I mean by this is, is that the n insertion orders of the n keys that are in the tree, that they, they are all equally likely. So you pick one insertion order uh, from, from these n factorial ones and all with probability 1 over n factorial. So to give you an example, let's say n is 3. Then we have the insertion orders, six different ones, like this. And the last one. Well, if you insert these into the tree, then you get one, two, three, one, three, two, two, one, three, two, three one, which is actually the same tree, right? Three, one, two, three, two, one. So it's five different trees. And well, this, this tree has probability one over six, this has one over six, this has one over three, because it's twice the same, one over six, one over six. Uh, so far, so good. Let's just uh, a simple example so that you see that this is not a uniform distribution on the tree shape, but it's already visible in, in, uh, in this representation that actually the more balanced trees are favored by this distribution. Right, so there's only one balanced tree if you have three keys. And this has twice the probability of the others. Now, uh, as a very simple first uh, observation, we can obtain such a random BST on n plus 1 keys. Let's call it Tn plus 1. By inserting n plus 1 keys in random order into an initially empty tree, uh, but we can also start with a tree that already has n keys in there and is randomly chosen. So the shape of this tree Tn is randomly chosen according to, the diff to this distribution. And now we insert an element into one of the gaps in this tree. And this might be maybe something that we could add to the tree. we can add these external leaves to all of the trees, which are at, at all the positions where there's either the left or the right or both pointers uh, null. And of course, there will always be one more such leaf than we have keys in the tree. And the, the, this lemma says if we pick one of these gaps or leaves, 
uniformly from all the possible choices, so four in this case, and we add a new node um, at this position, so replace that leaf by a new node. Then we get actually a tree with n plus one keys that has the same distribution as if we had built it from, uh, from scratch. This is not really surprising because it's essentially the definition of these random BSTs. But what's behind this is that a random insertion order is essentially a permutation of the ranks so of the numbers 1 up to n plus 1. So the insertion order in Tn plus 1. Well, in this permutation, um, is is in bijection with a pair of things, namely a permutation of the numbers 1 up to n and the last value of the perm of a permutation so how, how does this bijection look like if you have um, if you have the permutation it looks like this so one that's just an, an order, the insertion order. Then you can take the last value, which is 3, and subtract and then split it off. So that's going to be the second part of, the, of this pair. And the first results from taking the same permutation where you chop off this last number, and every number that's larger than 3 is reduced by 1. By that you get an, a different, uh, the sequence looks different, but this is actu it's actually the same, the same kind of uh, permutation, just brought back to the, the range 1 to n. And this is a bijection. You can go back and forth easily by just um, adding this to the end and then adding one to all the entries that were greater or equal to three, you get back to this one. And that's essentially what you do. In Tn, there's just these numbers. Now you pick, um, you pick a new key that you insert in the insertion order, you insert it at the end, but in the tree you have to fit it between uh, two and three in the, tr in the in the tree, so it's the third leaf, if you count from the left, where you will um, insert it. Um, Is it the third leaf or is it is there an, an off by one? So it can be a number one up to n plus one. It should be the third leaf. But you're actually making that number larger. No, it's no it's fine. Right. That means the three that was it would insert here, though the, this has to be larger than that, so yeah, it works. It works all out nicely. So this is the number, the, the the rank of the leaf. It's the third leaf where you insert a new element, and that means if you want to have a permutation of that shape, you have to increment the value of all larger en entries. So that's simply a bijection that underlies this lemma: how you can get from a tree to a larger one. You can, the same thing is actually much more transparent if you consider this corollary. A random, a random BST can also be obtained by inserting n IID numbers. So 
and independent numbers, and that's important here in the independence, where each of the numbers is chosen according to some continuous distribution, uh, you could actually replace this uniform by uh, any continuous distribution. It's just that the uniform is maybe just the, the simplest distribution of that kind. Um, the reason why this is the same as uh, a BST as we defined it is that if you pick such numbers independently, because it's a continuous distribution, you almost surely have no uh, number twice. So there's probability zero to have uh, duplicate entries here. And because they're independently chosen, the relative ranking of any of these numbers is just uh, chosen randomly, so uniformly at random. And so that means if you replace these numbers by their ranks in this, in this collection of random variables, then you get a random permutation, almost surely. So that's something that will, um, that will be used later a lot. But for the moment, that's, let's just keep that here for reference. Now, to come back to this lemma, let me do it like this. What this corollary tells us is if we have a tree with n keys, where these are all just iid chosen on the unit interval. Now we build a tree where we insert these in the order there where I, that I just draw them. And now we draw another one. Then the probability that this red guy falls into any of these of these intervals here is actually a, uni a uniform distribution. So the number, the index of the interval, if that would be, let's say start with one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So here the, the red one that would give a five because it's in the fifth interval. The probability for this red guy to end up in the fifth interval is the same as the probability to end up in any of the other intervals if we don't know the black dots, if we average over all black dots. That's essentially what's used in this lemma. Um, and which, so this lemma is, is trivial if you know that this is true, because then the last dot that you draw is, is just independent of all the rest and just happens to fall at some point. So it's, uh, it's clear that the resulting tree is, is as random as, is, as if you had started with one of such and then add another one. Um, and what this tells you is that the index of the gap where this number falls in is, is uniform, at, uniform in the numbers one to seven in this case. And that's something we'll use later uh, a lot. Now for the first result on, on the typical behavior of these randomized uh, BSTs, we look at the first example here, which is the following theorem. The expected depth, so the expected number of edges on the path from the root to that, to that thing, which is here. So the expected depth of the leftmost external leaf in a random BST is given by the nth harmonic number. So you might recall that this is just given by the sum, which is asymptotic to L and N, as you might know. Um, so that means the leftmost external leaf has logarithmic expected depth in the tree. So let's consider our example again. The leftmost leaf here is of course always this one. 
and let's just compute the expected depth of this leaf in these trees. So here we have one edge, here as well, here we have two, here we have two, and here we have three. So if you average over these, that's one plus one plus twice two, plus two plus three, divided by six, because we have six trees overall. And that's just um, 11 over six. And if we evaluate the harmonic number for n equals three, it's one plus one half plus one third, which if you bring it to one fraction, six plus three plus two, which is also 11 over six. So it checks out for our example. And what you might also note here is that this is slightly less than two, right? Which uh, also means here that, well, it, it's, it's obvious from the numbers, we have two on average for these, we have two for these, and then we have ones, two ones, but only one three, so it's clear that it must be less than two. So let's um, briefly prove this first analysis result on random BSTs. And the, the proof is, is very simple. Once you have uh, the following key insight, this depth of the of this leftmost leaf, so of the leaf one in the tree, is exactly the number of left to right minima in the insertion sequence. So maybe it's uh, something we have to define and let's just uh, do an example. Um, so it's a, oh, that should be a four. It's just an example I made up. So three, two, five, four, one, that's gonna be the tree. Then we have the leaves like this. And of course our leaf one is, is this one. Now let's just label the nodes on this path from the root to the leaf one. That was three, that was two, and that was one. Now a left to right minimum of this sequence is, so this is a left to right minimum if, if you only look at the prefix ending here, then if this is the smallest number you've seen up, up to this point, then it's a left to right minimum. So this one is. This one also is because it's smaller than three. Five, if you only look up to here, no. Four, no. But one certainly is because it's the smallest overall. And what I claim here is that well, I claim the depth is the number of these. I can actually say the labels on the path to L1 are exactly the left to right minima. namely even in the right order. Three, two, one is exactly the labels that we got on this path. And if you think about it, this is actually just the definition of a binary search tree. We insert the sequence from left to right and we make a note from the current smallest key to the left. Whenever we find something, an, a key that's smaller than everything we've seen before. 
that's an if and only if. So we make that link because when the two was inserted, this, it was the minimum in the tree. And the same for the one. And the path from L1 up to the root always must consist of these, of this minima over time. And left to right minima are exactly minima of the tree at a certain time during uh, which it was built. So it remains to count the expected number of left to right minima because that was what we were claiming. In a random permutation of the numbers 1 to n, that's what we still have to, uh, to show. And we can essentially write this. Um, so this is even true for the random numbers. Let's call this L to R N. That's the number of left to right minima in such a random permutation. And we can write this as the sum over all positions over xi, where xi is, is the indicator random variable of the event that the position i is a left to right min. That was exactly how we determined the numbers here we counted how many are left to right minima. And it's easy to see that the probability that xi is 1 is exactly 1 over i. Because in, a, in the prefix of the permutation that you now consider, so this is the position you consider. If you only look at this prefix, so what you have inside of here is actually irrelevant. And the part that's in here is again isomorphic to a random permutation of the numbers 1 up to i. If you just look only at the ranks, and this here is exactly a minimum if and only if this is the smallest of all these numbers. So if, if the number 1 in this random permutation sits here, and in a random permutation, the position of, this, of the minimum is just uniformly distributed over all possible positions. That's why we get this. And from that, it's an easy computation. The number of left to right minima is then the sum of these expectations. And these are just for indicator random variables. We just sum the probability that it's 1. And that's Hn. <coughs> so this is actually a very, very simple kind of uh, result for the depth of the leftmost external leaf. And what's nice about this proof is that you essentially just had to have the right intuition on what to count. The computation here was really simple, right? Uh, there's not so much stochastics involved in this case, uh, but you had to have the right uh, idea here. We even showed a bit more. We showed that actually the depth of this leaf has the distribution of this number of left to right minima because uh, this equality is true for every, every fixed tree, not only in expectation. So if you study the distribution of these left to right minima in more detail, you will also find uh, more results about the distribution of the depth because they are the same. Uh, but for, for our case here, we will confine ourselves to the expectation.
Now this result, uh, as it stands, might seem like a very peculiar and very specific result that's so narrow in scope, only talking about the leftmost leaf, that it's uh, hardly useful. Uh, but we will see next time that you can actually uh, generalize this result easily uh, a very good deal so that you have um, a very precise understanding of the shape of a typical of the expected binary search tree if you insert keys in random order. And that's where we continue next time.